Thank you for joining us. This is Joy Hoffmeister, State Superintendent, and I appreciate your time. Um, it looks like we have, um, we will reach capacity within just a few minutes. We're at 980 on this call currently. And uh, for those who are unable to join the call, it will be recorded for those who would want to uh, share this or listen afterwards. Uh, we will try to talk um, and re slowly and repeat key information for those taking notes, if that is helpful as well. All right, today is March 23rd, 2020, and I would like to begin the call by uh, addressing the group in terms of where we are in um, our response to COVID-19 and the support of students. I want to compliment uh, so many of you who have worked to provide meals and those plans to be providing meals with the waivers that we have received. Since we talked last, we have had additional waivers and we'll get into some of those, but I do want you to know that um, we are um, assessing the situation and looking for all opportunities to have additional waivers. We will be taking some to the state board, but we are receiving federal waivers as well. Uh, beginning um, after our call, we will uh, have an opportunity soon to post some a statement sharing some of this information that I'd like to share with you right now. Uh, later today, I will announce that we will propose a continuous learning plan to the State Board of Education this week to complete the school year for Oklahoma students without reopening school buildings during this global pandemic. While the education of school children will resume with distance learning, there will not be traditional in-person instruction or extracurricular activities. Um, there will not be, uh, and instead, cr um, following critical safety guidance from the Centers for Disease Control with regard to social distancing for students, staff, and our school families. So just to repeat that, um, we will take to the board on March the 25th, Wednesday morning at 9.30 a.m., and we will make a proposal to the State Board of Education to complete the school year for Oklahoma students using a continuous learning plan without reopening school buildings during the global pandemic. While the education of school children will resume with distance learning, there will not be traditional in-person instruction or extracurricular activities. Instead, following critical safety guidance from the CDC, with re we will, we will uh, observe those uh, efforts for social distancing and sheltering at home uh, where that is advised. So there are several actions that we will take to the State Board of Education on Wednesday morning. And I'd like to walk through what uh, you can expect. First of all, it's important to know that the board meeting will be live streamed on the State Department of Education's Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash OCLA SDE. Among the items that the board will address are the following. Now through April 6th, there is a dedicated window to prepare for phase two. We will clarify what is allowable between the time of the board meeting on Wednesday and April 5th. The board will vote and consider action on keeping buildings closed through the end of the school year with instruction beginning again on April 6th. Districts will be directed to make every effort to provide alternative or distance learning opportunities during this time while taking into account the needs and resources with their local communities. The OSCE has established 
a distance learning team that is developing resources to assist districts, including a framework to set expectations. Awarding of credits is a local determination. We encourage local education agencies to use this flexibility so that students in the graduating class of 2020 or earlier who were on track to graduate before the gubernatorial declaration of emergency and any subsequent amendments to that proclamation are not negatively impacted by measures taken by the local education agency in response to the, no, to the novel coronavirus. The State Board will grant waivers for the duration of the school year, or Brad, is it for the duration? It would be for June 30th. School year. For the school year. For the following items, and we will answer questions in just a moment about these items. So again, the State Board will grant waivers uh, or we will uh, take to them the action item to grant waivers for the duration of the school year for the following items. One, required instructional hours and days. Two, minimum length of instructional day. Three, accreditation. Four, restrictions on funds i.e. textbooks, um, RSA, uh, six, physical education requirements, seven, school board member continuing education, eight, ADA March 1 date as a cutoff point that would span from the beginning of the year till March 1, 2020 for those calculations. And 10 is TLE requirements. We do have some new information to share which will be included in updated FAQs also later today. Uh, the first topic here is about U.S. history tests. The State Department of Education will take an emergency rule to the State Board of Education on this March 25th board meeting this week to allow OSDE to provide a medical exemption for state assessments for all students. As a result, pending board action, students scheduled to take the U.S. history assessment this year will be granted a medical exemption due to the coronavirus pandemic. If by chance anyone on the call, which my goodness, we're way over the limit. I thought it could only have a thousand, but it has 1,094. Um, if any of you have not uh, received the news, but Friday late in the evening, or in the evening, we received um, that news that our assessment and accountability waivers that are federal were granted by the U.S. Department of Education. So that remain, keeps um, on the table this need for action on U.S. history tests. And I'm sure you are also asking in your mind, if not already chatting, about what about the eighth grade driver's test requirement? So let me address that. Oklahoma law requires students to successfully complete the reading portion of the eighth grade English language arts assessment in order to apply for a driver's license or permit. However, due to the test not being administered this year, we are working with the Department of Public Safety to find another solution. We hope to have that mechanism solidified for the FAQs to come. Brad, those will not be included in today's FAQs, is that correct? It is in there. It is in there, okay. Another topic that many of you are probably asking um, about for clarity is Reading Sufficiency Act. Oklahoma schools are not expected to and should not administer the required end of year screening assessment for students in kindergarten through grade three for the remainder of the school year. Schools should utilize data collected from screening, diagnostic, and progress monitoring assessments 
prior to March 16th to make promotion and retention decisions. Any decision by school districts to convene a student reading proficiency team, SRPT, to make decisions about promotion or retention should do so virtually whenever possible. It is not, if it is not possible, teams are encouraged to adopt social distancing guidelines, but that should be a rarity. Limiting gatherings to no more than 10 people at a time and maintaining six feet apart between each person, even in smaller groups, is important. I would recommend you do phone calls if you do not have another way to do them um, virtually to avoid contact. More detailed guidance for districts making third grade promotion decisions in the absence of our OSPP scores will be forthcoming from the OSBE. Let me just pause for a moment in case, um, okay, it's our understanding back to the eighth grade um, writing, reading test that, uh, driver's test that the Department of Public Safety has had one meeting, but will uh, also have another meeting later today. Um, and we are still waiting for them for that um, final determination as we craft, draft uh, the FAQ. All right, then we have certification news. We will take an emergency rule to the board this Wednesday, March 25th, to adopt an extension for a possible third year emergency certification for individuals that are recommended by their district and who have made progress toward their certification. Additionally, the governor's emergency executive order revised yesterday extended all occupational licenses so long as the executive order is in effect and for 14 days following the withdrawal of the order. At this time, before um, we hear from Child Nutrition, where I will uh, ask Jennifer Weber to give an update, and then following that, a uh, special education update from Todd Lofton. Before we do that, I'm gonna just ask uh, Brad Clark if you have anything additionally to add or clarify. So in anticipating um, a question about when schools can convene uh, staff meetings and, and staff development, uh, I think this is an item that we intend to take to the board on Wednesday morning, um, understanding that um, districts are in a position and are, are likely to um, be desiring to start those as soon as possible. I think that um, in anticipation of Wednesday's board meeting, we would um, be in a position to encourage, uh, if that can happen remotely, to go ahead and, and begin doing so. Um, the second point that I would just uh, bring up is in exchange for the waivers, uh, the list that we've been discussing uh, this morning, or this afternoon, excuse me, um, I, I believe that we are looking at uh, a simple um, yet necessary set of assurances that districts would be um, required to provide the State Department of Education in exchange for um, receiving those flexibilities and, and waivers. Again, it, it will be um, targeted and expedited in review. Um, I do not see this as being more than um, two to three pages, uh, just to give you an idea, but um, we are, are building that out right now. I uh, just wanted to bring that to attention. All right, at this time also then, let's move back to uh, the prepared remarks that we wanted to ensure you had today. Um, is Jennifer Weber available?
Kristen Lunch on the seamless summer. Okay, here. And you may do okay, the summer um, and one moment, one moment. It sounds, it, it appears that people cannot hear Jennifer. We may need her to get on the Zoom. I will, can I come down there real quick? Yeah. Oh, she's, yeah, so now, right the, now the sound is oh, on. Oh, actually, now the sound is on. They can hear. Oh, okay. So, okay, sure. okay, so Jennifer, I need to ask that you begin again. Okay. Uh, we had a call with USDA this morning, as we are every day at 10 o'clock, and there are some questions that have been asked that are still out. One is um, that was asked last night after we issued uh, the announcement that you could give them breakfast and lunch five days on Monday if you would like. Several people emailed and asked if they could also include Saturday and Sunday on that. And as of right now, that is a no, but they are reaching out to the national um, office in D.C. to get an answer. So we hope to maybe have that answer tomorrow at our 10 o'clock call. Several of you have also asked over the last week or so, if you are already approved for the at-risk after-school program, many of you know that as the third meal or refer to it as the third meal, asked if you could do supper and a snack on that program. If you're already approved, um, you may start doing a supper and a snack on the at-risk program. You'll claim your breakfast and lunch on the seamless summer program, and you'll, which is part of the national school lunch program, and you'll claim your supper and snack on the um, child and adult care food program that we refer to as CACFP, um, you'll claim those on that uh, program. And we can give f further guidance down the road on that a little bit. That was uh, answered this morning. Um, we have also still do not have an answer uh, from USDA as to whether the children have to be uh, in the car or a parent can just come and get the meals. I apologize. If I could get you an answer any faster, I absolutely would, but USDA uh, is telling us there's apparently a sticking point to that, and they're having to really look into that further. I, I don't, that's all I can say there. Um, I'm flipping through my notes, I apologize. Uh, right now, we are still, uh, many of you started serving this morning, and that's wonderful. I've been getting pictures and emails and things, so um, congratulations and way to go on that. That's the whole idea, is make sure these kids get fed during this time. Um, and if your application, if there's a few that, there's still some out there that we're approving and that's fine. Please continue to serve. We will get you approved by the time you need to file a claim. I, I assure you, my people are working all hours of the day and weekends to get that done. Um, that's about all the updates I have, but at one po at some point I'm sure there'll be some questions for me. Um, I do have a question. Could you speak about the uh, meals? Is it meals for you, meals to you? Meal meals to you, yes. Uh, we are setting up a call um, for hopefully tomorrow with our regional people regarding the Meals to You program. And that is an initiative with Baylor University and the Texas Hunger Initiative to, uh, if your school is eligible and there are three required eligibility requirements that have to be met, the school can opt in to this program. And uh, like I said, we, we are having a call tomorrow on this and I will have um, even more information on it at that point. Okay, thank you. All right, now um, let's ask Todd. Well, wait, actually, uh, why don't we keep Jennifer on? And if there are questions that are coming through, um, well. There are, Superintendent, I have a few. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that, yeah. Okay, Jennifer, um, a couple of questions. Would you just mind repeating the information about how many meals a school can serve at a time? There are several people wanting to make sure that they heard right and understood right what the allowances are for how many meals you can give out at the same time. Okay, you can, if you, everybody basically that's listening to this has applied for the seamless summer option SSO. You can give breakfast and lunch, those two meals through that program for five days on Monday if you'd like. You can also, if you're already approved for the at-risk after-school program, which many of you refer to as the third meal, if you are approved for that, you can also give 
supper and a snack through that program as well. And you can do that on Monday for the five days. Does that help? Yes, thank you. And could you also repeat the information about the 50% and, um, and the status of the 50% waiver? We still have a waiver uh, that was sent to USDA regarding the 50% requirement, the site having to be 50% free and reduced. I do not have an approval on that. And as far as I know, it's been sent up the chain of command that it has to go to for USDA. I assure you we are not the only state awaiting approval on that. Many of the states, if not all of them, have requested that. Also, uh, Jennifer, is do I understand that with the meals to you that is that can be mailed? Yes, those are meals. Yes, yes, those are meals that are mailed. It's five days worth of meals, breakfast and lunch, um, and, and they are mailed to the families directly. We have the school opts in because we have for confidentiality and, and address purposes, we have to go through the school to get all of that. There's an application process. It is not lengthy at all for the school to do. Um, and then based on what they submit and the eligibility requirements, um, at that point, we would um, kick in with the pro the program would kick in. I, I, I don't have all the information, so I'm trying to give as much as I can at this point and to where the meals could be sent to the home for the children. Okay, so my, my question is, if I understood earlier that there is, that, that the family has to actually apply for that. Right. Or just the school? The school district applies on behalf of their children, but there is an application process, a small, short application process the families have to do as well. And could that be extended to a district that is, that does not meet the 50% threshold currently, but they have children that qualify for free, free or reduced price lunch? The information that I currently have is that the school requ eligibility requirements are that the school has to announce a close for at least four weeks. They have to be area eligible based on the summer feeding program, which is 50% free and reduced, or there's some census data that we're allowed to use, and they have to be designated as rural. Now, as of right now, those are the three requirements. Okay. I have not heard that that has changed. All right. But again, we, we are having a call tomorrow. All right. All right, then we have questions um, that I'm sure you will have as well um, on special education. But before we go to that, are there other questions we need to ask Jennifer? I have a couple more, Superintendent. Um, there's questions about if you're going to serve multiple meals at a time, can it be on a date other than Monday? Could they do multiple meals if they gave it on Tuesday or Wednesday? Is there any impact there? Uh, that was asked this morning on our call, and USDA is defining um, right a week or five days right now is um, five school days. That's why we're having to get clarification on the Saturday and Sunday. So um, if, they're, if they give them on Tuesday, they can only go Tuesday through Friday. And ensuring, keep in mind, we have to ensure that food safety is met at all times. And, and if there's instructions that need to go out as far as Make sure you go home and refrigerate your milk. Please let them know that as well. Okay, there was a question um, as to whether or not, uh, Superintendent, if we have a stay at home order um, in some portion of the state or all of the state, would schools still be able to deliver and hand out lunches? Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I think. Will take that. I, that's a good question, number one. Um, I think it's going to depend. Um, we've seen states who have already issued these stay-at-home orders. Um, they vary in what, what is allowable and what is deemed essential, um, but that is something that, that we've been in conversation uh, about and are prepared for that. Um, uh, so that, that's the best I can answer that right now, but um, good question. We would do everything within our power to keep meals going. But if a community is ordered to be at home, uh, there could be other provisions perhaps sent in. 
but we'll we'll work on that. Okay, uh, one, uh, two more, I guess, um, for Jennifer. Um, can a non-title site be used as a serving location? In regards to non-title, meaning a site that doesn't meet the fifty percent, is that? I'm guessing. I don't know. That was the exact wording of the question. And can you say it one more time? I'm sorry, Karen. Can a non-title site be used as a serving location? I'm not sure what a title site would be, but as of right now, the requirement is that a site in order to serve must be 50% free and reduced. Okay, um, we'll move on to a different question. I've gotten a couple of comments about milk and schools not being able to get milk. Um, something from Highland Dairy who said that they would not be able to deliver milk and how does that impact what schools are able to serve? Yes, I, I brought that call up because that was emailed directly to me this morning by a superintendent and I was not aware of that, but he did inform me that his Highland representative informed him that they are only producing gallons of milk right now and not cartons. I have for the state, for us, issued a meal pattern and flexibility waiver, and that was done over a week ago, and I have not received approval on that. They are well aware that nationwide there are milk issues for schools, for our child care centers, only being limited on the number of gallons. Um, none of those meal pattern flexibility waivers have been approved. Um, Okay, I feel like we could probably go on with this on and on, but I don't know if we want to go ahead and shift to another topic. I think we should, and we'll have more information every day. So we will be able to use these questions to help inform what we bring to USDA. Thank you. And now uh, let's get a update from our um, uh, Todd Lofton with education, uh, special education. Hi, hopefully everybody can hear me. Okay, so uh, for, spe for special education, I just want to reiterate three big ideas uh, that have been said before, but safety. And based on that, we're trying to provide education to the most appropriate extent possible. And we simply want districts to do the best that they can. So our office is working on guidance and we'll be publishing it soon on distance learning for special education. Uh, that will include things like related services, AT, assistive technology, secondary transition services, uh, behavior management, instruction, lots of online resources specific to special education. And then early childhood, we'll be sending some information out about how to hold a virtual IEP meeting. Um, so all of those things will be going out and I'm sure will be updated on a continuous basis. We will also know more about uh, special ed finance, uh, in particular maintenance of effort, time and effort, excess costs, carryover, all of those things after a call tomorrow with the Center for IDA Fiscal Reporting. The, a few other things, uh, dispute resolution complaints, you know, we're working with our National Dispute Resolution Center on processes and timelines, things like that for dispute resolution. OSEP just released Saturday night supplemental guidance to their previous guidance on educating students with uh, students in special education during the uh, coronavirus, and and we'll uh, we'll be posting that to our website as well. And then we will be issuing more guidance on data and reporting. And some of you have already been contacted about any monitoring activities that we've been engaged with you during the spring and we'll, we'll be following up on those. Thank and that's you. really all I have to share for now. Hey Todd, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, could you talk about IEP deadlines and um, what the expectation is for meeting deadlines? Uh, the Office of Special Education Programs and the OSDE as well has no authority to waive any timelines. 
So that would take, uh, only Congress would have the authority to do that. Any IP meetings that are due are still due. Uh, the expectation is that IP meetings would be held virtually and that districts would support their teachers in being able to provide those uh, virtually. We understand, obviously, if that's not a possibility. What we would be hoping is that districts are as much as possible in contact with parents. And um, so that, that expectation still exists. And that's been in all of our guidance so far, which is why we'll be uh, sending out some information on exactly how to do a virtual meeting. And then uh, there's, there's several things online just on EdPlan. There's the ability to do digital signatures. Uh, there's the ability to share documents um, on, on various platforms. So we'll be providing that information to help give teachers a little easier time with it. On Twitter. Todd, could you clarify about OT and PT services um, and speech? What, um, what is the expectation there for related services? So most of those professional organizations have issued guidance around teletherapy and uh, other ways to provide services to students, whether it's information to parents, any packets, that kind of thing. We'll be posting that information to our website also. If students miss services during the closure, districts will have to consider what, if any, compensatory services are required later. Okay, and I think you maybe covered this, but can an IEP meeting um, be done via a phone call? Yes, but I, phone calls and video conferences of always been uh, allowed under the IDA. And if that is not available, um, is there guidance as far as if, if a, a phone conference or video conference is not available? If in the circumstance that a phone conference or video conference is not available and a school cannot meet at a school to have the IEP meeting, then you know we don't have a lot of suggestions other than that needs to all be documented. Todd, could you speak to any um, issues or concerns around due process um, or OCR complaints? Yes, yeah, so I'm fairly positive OCR is going to be um, obviously understanding the situation um, for state complaints also and due processes. Most things are going to can be extended uh, upon mutual agreement and I don't see that not happening, that mutual agreement. Okay, is there um, a change in placement requirement? Do um, IEPs need to be updated to indicate um, a home placement? An IEP, unless it's due, if you wanna do an amendment, just FYI, would not require a meeting. Um, and it's not technically a change in placement if most of the services are not changing because placement is not physical location. Mm -hmm. So in most cases, it's probably not a change in placement, although the IPT might determine they need a different, um, that their learning needs would necessitate what might be considered a change in placement. But okay. across the board, no, all IPs do not need to be changed. And this may be a question for Brad. Um, can they have a virtual meeting between now and April 6th if there's a deadline during that period? And just to clarify, you're talking about a, a school board meeting? No, an IEP meeting. Yes. It has a deadline during that. Yes, all yes. IEP meetings are due the day they are due. And our guidance is that you should hold a virtual meeting if possible. Okay, I think that that about covers most of, I think most of the questions that we had um, on IEPs. Um, Superintendent Brad, are you ready to move to other questions? Well, I, can I uh, address yeah. one of the questions? Go ahead. Uh, uh, Robert Romines is asking, do we need to plan for ESY or hold? Uh, ESY 
just like any service can is you know individualized for the student so i think that you know you're thinking about what students assert uh, what services a student missed you need to think about some comp ed but also you do need to start thinking about esy and how you might uh, provide esy or ex that's extended school year services those could also be delivered virtually okay um superintendent brad are we ready to move on to other topics yes let's go ahead um and move on that thank you okay um we're getting some questions about um uh, for emergency certified teachers and making progress um, towards certification and what that might look like as far as um, the ability to extend that emergency by an extra year. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, sure. It, just to reiterate, um, as the superintendent mentioned uh, in her opening comments, the governor's executive order, the, the third amended executive order, um, automatically extends any certificate or, or occupational license um, that is set to expire as long as that executive order remains in effect. Um, so those would continue uh, without any further action. Uh, and that further action uh, is, is me saying that the, the rule that we intend to take to the board on Wednesday morning uh, would allow a emergency uh, certificate to be extended for an additional year uh, for up to a maximum uh, period for three years. Okay, and um, similar question, but slightly different. For a newly graduated teacher that may not be able to take their certification exam, um, would it be advisable that a district apply for an emergency for that person until they're able to secure uh, their permanent certificate? I think that's a good idea. Um, and just to show that we are continuing uh, operations as we normally would, the request that were submitted and prepared for the, the March meeting, uh, those will, will be taken um, on Wednesday morning as well. So any district that submitted the request and um, was prepared for the March meeting, those will go ahead on Wednesday morning as well. Okay, switching gears. Um, uh, Brad, could you clarify whether or not um, the CPR requirement and the personal financial literacy um, requirement will be included in what goes to the board on Wednesday? Uh, sure, uh, they, they will be included. Um, and just to dive in a little deeper here, those are statutory requirements. And so um, the State Board of Education does not necessarily have the authority to override what is in statute. Um, although we're, we're seeking as much as possible to grant waivers from that, I would also say that um, with respect to credits awarded for courses, those are local determinations. And so we would encourage, um, as superintendent mentioned in the opening comments, to um, not negatively impact students as a result of, uh, of everything with COVID-19. Okay, and similarly, um, what about uh, uh, under the TLE requirements, a teacher who has not had their evaluation yet this year? Uh, that is a waiver that we are um, proposing to take to the board to waive in full for this year, uh, particularly as we move to this continuous learning um, program. Uh, it seems to me that it would not be uh, appropriate to uh, evaluate a teacher uh, or hold them to that, if you will, uh, based on a form of, of learning, uh, especially during this time that we find ourselves in. So that, that is a waiver that we are taking to the board on Wednesday. And then to clarify, will schools have to apply for these waivers? Is that what you meant by uh, the mention of an assurances document? Is that essentially an application for the waivers? Could you clarify exactly what you meant by that? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, the waivers that we are taking to the board, they will not require uh, districts to apply for those waivers. Um, so just to give an example on the, the length of the school calendar, the 180 days, 1,080 hours. Normally, um, the limited circumstance for a waiver on that requires a district to apply for that waiver. What we are proposing to do on Wednesday morning is a uniform blanket across the board waiver without any district having to apply for that. 
um, the assurances shifting to those that I, I mentioned um, really relate to um, ensuring that you know districts have um, ha will or have a continuous learning plan in place to provide instruction throughout the remainder of the year. Again, uh, understanding needs and resources vary across communities. And that they will follow the CDC guidance, guidance and um, that they have read and have assurance given to follow the special education guidance regarding distance learning amid COVID-19, et cetera. Okay, and then lastly on this topic, um, someone asked about drills being waived, and I feel like we talked about that at one point. Um, are we going to waive future drills? And then also question about treasure and encumbr encumbrance clerk training. Um, I'm glad you asked that question about the encumbr encumbrance clerk. I think um, Kathy Black and, and the staff in OCAS have already sent an email, um, so if I can talk about school audits, that will be one of the waivers that we take to the board on uh, Wednesday morning, uh, not to waive the audit entirely, but there is a requirement that those audits are normally presented to the School Board of Education. Um, understanding where we are right now, it does not seem entirely feasible um, to convene a, a board meeting just to present the audit. Um, we know that the audits are, are primarily done, and so we would waive the requirement for the audit acknowledgement form. Um, school board member training requirements, those are, are being taken to the board on Wednesday morning. And apologize, Carolyn, I, I forgot what the other part of that question was. Uh, drills, fire drills, other safety drills. Yeah, um, as of right now, um, those are under the accreditation checklist. And so uh, with accreditation, as a whole being put on pause. Um, in other words, there will no, be no accreditation audits that will be taking place. Um, this is the recommendation that we'll take to the board anyway, um, that there would be no more accreditation audits for the year. Uh, those drills fall under that, so um, those drills would be waived. Um, however, um, I am reluctant, I guess, to um, to waive those drills knowing that we're going into uh, severe weather season. But um, I hope that answers that question. Yes, I think so. Okay, we've got uh, obviously a lot of questions about the distance learning and I've kind of been holding all of those um, so that we can kind of tackle them all at once. Uh, so superintendent, if you're ready to dive into some of those questions, we can do that. Okay, let's go. Okay, um, lots of concerns about lack students lacking connectivity um, or devices and then how that impacts equity for students. Could you address that? Yes, and we recognize that and will also uh, acknowledge <clears throat> that in a statement that we'll make later uh, today. But it, it is something that uh, we know districts are in different places. Some have spent years preparing for digital online learning platforms and the use of that. Others are um, choosing to use a vendor. Others don't have the, even the, the bandwidth or capability to do that if they wanted to. So this is definitely not something that will be prescriptive. Um, it is going to be um, very different in different communities. However, we are providing a framework and support grade by grade, so that our uh, schools will have some um, idea of expectation. It would not be a full day of class uh, activities the same way we would see in a school day in a traditional model, but it is one that needs some framework um, provided. So that is uh, nearly complete, and we will have that um, prepared and ready. Uh, for you during this week. Um, I can't give an exact date because I, I don't know if it's available today or by the board meeting. But we, we do want you to be free virtually through telephone uh, or through a conference call, uh, Zoom meetings to begin planning for this within your district. That does not 
mean you have a green light to gather in person with teachers, et cetera. But we do want to um, make it clear that on Wednesday, part of our recommendation to the board is to lift some of this conversation around teacher um, um, preparing for this new plan of distance learning. Um, and you are free to have, of course, any kind of virtual meeting like we're doing today. Um, but we would ask that, again, you, you help us in the effort that we all know um, we have to abide by which to, to um, flatten the curve. Um, all right. So um, when it comes to uh, this conversation, we typically talk a lot about equity and how uh, we want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to learn. And of course that is the case um, still and heavy on our hearts. But we, we want to reach as many children as soon as possible and identify those areas where it is not ideal. Um, we, would, we are um, pursuing congressional aid to assist with this as well. And in the meantime, we need to use creativity, and there are many ways that we can still connect through a alternative delivery model, um, including our career tech students. And guidance will come related to our career tech students that are um, needing to complete their credentials or coursework. Um, efforts are underway to assist in that, and I've been um, talking and working with Dr. Marcy Mack about this, and they are preparing to be able to support the completion of this with their K-12 students, um, as well as concurrent enrolled students with uh, higher ed, um, using their online platform for many of the schools um, that have universities that have canceled in-class uh, or in-person meetings. So we, we are determined to find a way to bring what our kids will need in order to hold ground, not lose the skills that have been built up to this time. And in some cases, we really want to focus on enriching what they've already learned and moving um, forward. We are uh, inclined to look at a end date that could be more uniform. Um, we are talking right now with other membership organizations that represent the different groups that you um, and your um, staff are a part of to get their thoughts on this. And then um, providing even additional partnerships that can help support this work um, with PBS and OETA and daytime programming um, to support some of the learning as well. Um, there's much more to come on this, and there's a quite extensive process that has uh, been developed and will be prepared and ready for you with a distance learning framework in just um, a very, very short time. Okay, uh, Superintendent, would you want to speak to any of the conversations that we've had about trying to get additional connectivity um, to families? Well, this is a, a state level um, effort and those are conversations that we are engaged in and will continue to be engaged in. We are um, looking at a federal potential federal relief with even mobile hotspots, um, sub the subscription for uh, that use of devices. Devices are free. It's the subscription that um, you pay for. Um, but we are working those details out and that is very common and uh, with, other, with other schools in other states. So this is something that we're we're on, but I don't have a complete answer yet for you, other than we think it's important for your schools and districts to begin uh, thinking about this, as we mentioned last Friday on the call, that we wanted to give you as much uh, preparation time as possible. 
Okay, Superintendent, can you um, address any expectations for giving grades um, during this time? Will teachers be expected to award grades um, from now until the end of the school year or from April 6th to the end of the year? We will answer that with our, uh, we have a counselor group that is working with higher ed and um, also with sta various um, stakeholder leaders to think through the impact with um, scholarships, with Oklahoma comments, um, other considerations, and uh, some of this will be included in FAQs that will be uh, coming, and uh, they are they are working with other um, guidance counselors and uh, principals that uh, work that deal with this work in in higher ed, making sure that um, we are working to support our students as they are preparing for transcripts to be ready. Um, but we don't want to make a decision today that somehow would have an um, unintended consequence related to their GPA and this this other aspect to it. So we need to hold off on a, on an answer right now. But that is coming um, very very shortly within a matter of days. And Superintendent, maybe just a note, um, uh, an individual commented in the in the chat that I thought was helpful that Cox Communication is offering 30 days of free internet to low income families. Uh, connect to compete. Um, looks like there might be a code or that is the um, program. So something that others on the call might make note of through Cox Communications. Okay, very good. And speaking of discussion around transcripts and graduation, I think it's really important that we also bring our creative people together that can still work uh, to plan for what we know is going to be a very different kind of graduation ceremony this year due to where we are with this pandemic. Um, I've heard some really neat stories about uh, how districts are trying to accomplish that virtually and we we will share out uh, or encourage those districts that have plans in place uh, or those that are being developed uh, to share some of what they are doing so that it can also inspire you uh, if, if that's something you're grappling with right now. Um, that is like very, very, very likely to still be a consideration with CDC guidance limiting groups no larger than 10. Okay, we've had a couple of questions about the connectivity survey. Do you have a status on when um, that might be coming out? That's part of the distance learning group. And I believe their work is pretty well finished right now. So I, I think you should be expecting that within a few days. Okay, um, had some questions about planning and um, virtual professional development being able to take place during the shutdown. Could you um, just address and clarify that um, as far as, as schools are trying to be sure that they're ready April 6th? Sure, Carolyn, I'll take that one. Um, the board's order from uh, March 16th, um, in no uncertain terms, prohibited staff development trainings and things of that nature. Um, as I said earlier, um, part of the recommendation for board action on Wednesday morning uh, this week is to lift that portion of the order uh, to remove that prohibition. And I think we're at a point where uh, districts need as much time as, as they can have um, to utilize uh, efforts to begin these uh, continuous learning programs and plans. And so uh, it's a long way of saying I, I think we're at the point to encourage districts to begin uh, those conversations, those preparations, uh, with one caveat, and that those uh, preparations are done virtually or remotely, not in person. Okay, Superintendent, there's been some questions about planning for summer school and if we have any advice or suggestions for um, how schools um, should prepare as they're going into the summer. 
Um, we've had conversations and they are ongoing, actually daily um, briefings that the governor, governor's office has with um, modeling, and mathematical modeling uh, related to when Oklahoma's um, COVID-19 will peak. And that is something that they believe it will not peak until um, August, potentially, or even as late as January. So the plans that you are making right now are plans that we understand are just a beginning response to this. And we're thinking about this as the next phase in a succession of different phases as we seek to educate our children over time and in the pandemic. Um, but I think we do need to think about the use of summer and then the fall under different arrangements that would, again, continue to reduce the spread. Um, so uh, that's about all I would be able to add at this point since we do have still so much unknown. And and again, I, I am sympathetic for the need to have clarity on this. Um, we are in a place right this moment where we're still in that defensive posturing for keeping our children safe and our staff and our families in the community. Um, the plans we are making right now are really, again, going on the offense and just, just trying to wrap our arms around how do we support learning for right now so that we can finish this school year and do that in a way that benefits our kids, uh, where they have structure, where they have connection with those individuals that are their safe a place and remind them of the security that they had with that school engagement. Um, there will be increasing um, reports of people who are sick, who are struggling to survive, and it's going to be more increasingly important for that stability and I think the engagement and structure we can afford children during a time like this is, is really, really important and we can't um, overstate that importance. But as we think about the summer and then we think even further ahead to a potential of a fall, that fall semester that could be impacted as well, this gives us room to gear up, to get that equipment that we know is needed uh, and to get homes wired with internet, et cetera. And um, if we do not need this because of a lifting of executive orders and, and recommendations of the CDC, then that's a wonderful thing. But we will have started important planning that's important for all of us uh, going forward as we know that we need um, to do uh, more of the digital learning in communities to meet individual needs for kids. But I do applaud and, and am grateful for all of the leadership for those represented on the phone call that are wrestling with doing this in um, an accelerated time frame. I've got just a couple more topics here to touch on and um, had a few questions about how schools are expected to enroll students that are moving into uh, the district when buildings are not open? Yes, Brad, could you answer yep. that? Um, I, I think that will also be a part of the assurances um, related to safety and health. Uh, at the same time, continuing um, enrollment as is required in, in statute. Um, so I think that will be addressed there. Um, the other thing that I think I will point out is um, currently the essential services the administrative uh, functions certainly could include um, individuals who, who help facilitate those enrollments. And so um, we will address that more in, in the guidance and in the assurances um, as, as we flesh those out. Uh, but at this time, you know, those, those can continue. Um, each local district has the ability to deem 
what is an essential administrative governance function, um, I think that would qualify under those. Okay, and then um, perhaps maybe the last topic um, would be um, sub, uh, the pay of support staff and got concerns perhaps on both sides of this about, um, you know, can support staff begin to be paid again after April 6th or um, concerns with equity of some support staff being required to come in and work and some support staff that are not able to and um, kind of what are our thoughts around those issues. This is, a, this is a really important topic and one that's weighed heavy on our hearts as well as those of you on the call. Uh, we know that we need our support staff members uh, and some of them right now as they're preparing meals and some of these other essential administrative functions. And then there are those who we will need during a time of distance learning. Uh, the, the, phone, the connections, um, the phone calls, the check-ins, the um, additional support with, with learning for some paraprofessionals as well. Um, there will be those that their, their duties may not be required um, with this different model. And uh, there, is a, there is an inequity here to think about requiring some or many to work and others not to, but that they all are paid at, this, uh, at the same way. And um, so as we are, you know, originally we were asking um, the legislature to be involved. They were very interested in this. Um, that has changed because of the timing of the um, Senate being under quarantine and the ability for them to conduct business is very, very limited. And right now the budget is the most important thing that I think they are working on. Um, the, the second thing is if there would be some federal remedy that may occur. And um, that is something we're still exploring. Um, there, I don't have a, um, an answer today, but I do have more information for you to consider. And this is just that we expect, as one can look around or watch the news and deduct, that we have a, a very, very um, serious economic condition with so many businesses stopped, so many services interrupted, and um, all while we're also in a down um, turn in the oil industry. So it is something where I think it's very important that districts um, tighten their belt as much as possible. Um, next year is going to be one that we predict will be <clears throat> very troublesome financially for schools and for all of all of those that rely on state government and state appropriated funds and uh, 1017 dollars as well um, so knowing that we think that we will have to um, try to address some options in the FAQs in fact we thought we had um, more of an answer today and ran up against another obstacle so uh, please just know we are still leaving this um, for you locally. These are our, your hourly employees um, that we know are important to the functioning of schools, and yet uh, we don't have a statewide answer at this time. Hey, Superintendent, um, maybe just any final comments. I feel like um, we've addressed a large majority of the questions and maybe just for, for folks to know that we do um, get the transcript of all of the chat questions after each call and we use that um, in trying to determine how we need to craft um, future FAQs and future items that need to be addressed. So even if we didn't address your question in specific, we do read through those and try to um, figure out what else we need to, uh, to address. So Superintendent, any last comments or from anybody else? Yes, so just finally, I would say now shift gears. Uh, let's get ready for distance learning and that's gonna look different in different schools, different grade bands, different districts and in various communities. Um, we can do that work, not in person, but 
through social media, you know, however you want to do that, or or with your um, not meaning broadcasting necessarily. I just mean with teachers um, and virtually in whatever platform or telephone um, accommodations they have. And teachers are chomping at the bit. We know that they want to get back to their students. And uh, we want their creative juices flowing as well. Um, also, let's be thinking about how we get our kids graduated. This is um, those who are on track. We want that to be a very primary focus for you as well. And how we can make the, these um, graduation ceremonies virtually done in a way that's still special um, to them. And then uh, special education. Keep. Um, Keep posted with those guidances that we're going to provide. Uh, keep those deadlines. Do them over the phone if needed. And um, let's start gearing up for the completion of the school year with learning occurring um, and um, new partnerships that we may not have had before this. And then think of this as a pull start to what we may need to do in the summer and in the fall as we gear up to keep learning going while we keep our children and communities safe. I appreciate all of you. We will have a call after the board meeting. You should already have that time and date. And at that time, we'll be able to discuss a little further uh, in detail on some of what the board took action on. All right, thank you so much.